computing technologies has exploded in popularity in recent years. Salesforce is one such technology that has had a significant impact on the computer world. Let us see how it all began. Customer relationship management CRM solutions used to be housed on a company's own server before Salesforce. Can you imagine how much money and effort it required for business to develop their own CRM systems? It used to take months, if not years, to set up and the cost might easily reach millions of dollars. They were difficult to use even when they were set up. What is a reasonable answer to this problem? I am sure you guessed it right. Creating affordable CRM software and delivering it as a service totally online. Salesforce has founded on this principle. Salesforce began as a software as a service company and has since evolved to become the world's fifth largest cost software company. So let's see what is Salesforce. Salesforce is a cloud-based software as a service provider, which means it maintains an online application that customers can use. It is based on a subscription-based pay-as-you-go business model. Now let's check how does Salesforce work. Customer 360 is the world's number one CRM enabling digital processes for the new way of working by simplifying communications and information exchange between customers, teams and partners. It provides tools that brings all teams together around a single shared view of client data on an integrated platform, including marketing, sales, commerce, service and IT. How? Companies can fix customer issues faster because they have a holistic perspective of each consumer. It also reduces communication redundancy and enables highly tailored interactions. Now let's check what are the different certifications for Salesforce. There are various certifications for getting certified in Salesforce like Salesforce Administrator, Salesforce App Builder, Salesforce Developer, Salesforce Platform Developer. So let's check what are the different benefits of Salesforce. Number one, Salesforce allows you to go from idea to app in the shortest amount of time. Salesforce customers generally say that it's unique for three major reasons, fast, easy, and effective. Because Salesforce is hosted in the cloud, your staff may access it from any computer with an internet connection. Salesforce is also cost effective, especially when you consider its extensive feature set. Salesforce is suitable for both startups and small businesses. Now let's see the salary prospects of a Salesforce professional in India. An entry-level Salesforce developer with less than one year of experience can expect to make an average total salary of Rs 3 lakh per annum, while an experienced Salesforce developer with 10 to 19 years of experience gets an average total salary of 14 lakh per annum. In the US, an entry-level Salesforce developer with less than one year of experience can expect to make an average total compensation of $65,000, while an experienced Salesforce developer with around 10 to 19 years of experience gets an average total salary of $116,000. Hello everyone and welcome to today's session on Salesforce LWC by IntelliPath. LWC is a new programming model leveraging the recent web standards. Rather than being a totally custom and development-wise rigid framework, it is quite flexible. It's mostly the common web standards and a thin layer of specialized services to make a perfect fit for the modern rich UI implementation in Salesforce. This thin layer of specialized services contain the base Lightning components, Lightning data services, and user interface API, which work behind the curtain for LWC. In this session, we will learn all about the Salesforce LWC. So without further wait, let's start the session. But before we begin the session, make sure to subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you'll never miss any update from us. So basically, this course is all about LWC. It's a new development paradigm that Salesforce is recommending after Aura. So like if we have people who already have experience with Aura, it is quite easy for them to pick up. So this framework is fully new. So we have everything written from scratch for this framework, right? So we all have to focus on what, what are the new elements and how they are structuring those elements in order to get it up. We will first talk about the system setup and we will see what are the legacy options we have and what is a recommended option that we should go for 
After that, I'll give you some brief understanding on ES6 fundamentals. So if uh, we need to learn LWC effectively, it is really important for us to understand the JavaScript, right? So in case if anybody is not comfortable with JavaScript, I would recommend to start working on it right up, okay? So JavaScript is like uh, we have a core JavaScript module as well as we have ES6, uh, which is JavaScript 2015, right? So LWC framework is mostly written on ES6 uh, modules and uh, those you will see like during the workshops that we are going to do for the LWC, right? So I'll give you some pointers, some resources where you can start uh, for LW uh, for ES6. And then gradually when we get into the workshops, I'll keep uh, guiding you on how to use it. Okay. And then we will talk about the introduction of the LWC framework. Why do we need this framework? And what are the benefits of using this framework? Uh, if we go for it. Okay. All right. So this is the step one where we will set up the stage and uh, we will you know, keep everybody ready with the system. And then we'll talk about uh, what is the LWC fundamentals are. So in the LWC fundamentals, you will look for LWC module uh, lifecycle web books. What is the purpose of this keyword decorators and how you should logically group your components and what are the benefits of this grouping. Events and properties, and then a little bit on the Lightning design system, which is the CSS part of the Lightning web components. So this LWC module, this concept comes from ES6. Uh, so ES6 is all about modules. Salesforce uses the same paradigm. They build everything inside the modules, and they allow us to download the module in the JavaScript and consume. So we'll see how, how we can do that. After covering the fundamentals, we will have two workshops that we will go for. And I'll provide you some examples that help you understand the structure of the tool. And we'll also see, I mean, how we can develop any functionality using LWC, right? What is the basic structure for the LWC applications? So in the advanced concept, we'll talk about Lightning Data Service. We'll also talk about the record forms. And then we will talk about the wire adapters, which are there in LWC. So these are the constructs that you can understand easily because Salesforce made sure that you don't need to write much code and they encapsulated everything behind these constructs. Okay, once we are done with this, uh, we will talk about the error handling, how we can work on the error handling part in LWC. And if time permits, we will also talk about the code migration because when we are learning LWC, there could be a requirement tomorrow that you guys already have some aura components that you need to migrate to LWC. Or probably you can be having visual force pages that you would like to migrate to the LWC framework, right? So in order to understand EX6 fundamental, you can refer to W3 school, right? So when you get into W3 schools, I'll provide you this uh, direct URL, you guys can have it. So if you navigate to this URL, you'll get to know that uh, we have a lot of features in ES6, right? There are two important features that you need to focus on. One is the promises, because promises are really important to understand to understand the functioning of the LWC constructs. And the other one is the module. Module is relatively simple. You are creating some kind of a you know, variable or the function which is there inside your JavaScript file that gets converted into a module that you can import to any other JavaScript file. So this is a paradigm that Salesforce adopted while working on the LWC framework, okay? But the promises, it is really important to understand what promises. So we can encapsulate multiple functions inside the promise, and then we can evaluate the promises later, right? To make sure that once all the execution is done, promise will return you one outcome, whether it is a success or a failure, and accordingly, you can take the action. So if you understand the basics of this, then I think we should be good for the LWC development, right? So just make sure that you understand it clearly and there is no confusion about it. 
So you can find a lot of examples on the internet and you can practice with those examples. Okay. Now let's talk about LWC today. What is LWC? So LWC is a brand new framework by Salesforce. So with this framework, Salesforce, you know, now the question is, what is the problem with Aura components? What is the problem with the Aura framework, right? There's no problem with the Aura framework, actually, because Salesforce has adopted it externally. So it is running on the proprietary technology, right? It is not a proper web stand. So they have their own, you know, uh, grammar of the Aura framework that any new developer has to learn from this scratch. So because of that, they, they, they keep on trying to adopt the whole more global standard on the web development where they can place their product in a, in a place where they can get the resources fast, where they can get the response better, where can they, they can get the resources to learn, right? So they try to migrate it faster, uh, to try to migrate it to the LWC, which is a native browser company, right? So LWC is basically using a native technology that runs, that keeps running everything inside the browser itself by using its own services. So it, it is much faster than what we have in Aura or the Visual Force pages. Certainly Visual Force pages, they are never part of component development. Right. So the core benefits of adopting LWC is it is based on the core web standards. So you can see that any modern web application would be having the same standards as LWC now. Right. It also increases the interoperability in case if you want to surface your LWC components externally. Right. It is also lightweight since it is running natively inside the browser. It don't need much of the services. Uh, to support uh, the component itself. So browser itself becomes a service that is supporting the component. So at the component level, we don't need to manage much. So it is much lightweight. It is following the web development standards. Uh, it is all based on JavaScript and HTML. So there is no uh, additional grammar added to it. So any JavaScript or HTML developer can adopt LWC quickly. So they don't need to have a fresh uh, learning curve around it. They can start with LWC and pick it up quickly as, as they know the web standards already right, for the development. Since it is easy to adopt, uh, we can find the resources quite easily in the market for LWC. So as long as anybody knows about JavaScript and HTML and CSS, we can group that resource on, as an LWC developer. And uh, like in the today's world, we have hybrid solutions that we are building. So the team size in this skill is according to that. And we could be having multiple developers from the web background uh, with little knowledge on Salesforce. But uh, LWC framework, since it is based on the web standards, it makes it, makes it easy for them to adopt. Okay. So we'll talk about LWC fundamentals now. So in the LWC fundamentals, every time you create any component, right? You will see this, these two lines at least, okay? Import lightning element from LWC. So there you need to understand this. This is really important to understand first before you getting into any code development, okay? This is your JavaScript file that is being generated when you create any LWC component, right? So what does this line mean? You are importing what from where? So in this statement, if you notice, LWC is the module that Salesforce have created using ES6, right? And in that module, it is actually calling a class which is called as lightning element, which is the base class of all the classes that we are going to define for LWC development, okay? So it is really important. In LWC, we have got a lot of other elements that will keep on adding as the time comes. But for now, just focus on the base class, which is lightning element, okay? Whenever you create a components, there is a naming convention that we should follow. It is not mandate though, but it's always good to follow that if you give the name of your component as my component, the JS class should be named by the same, same name, right? So this is a naming convention that you should follow, okay? Even if you change this name, nothing, you know, there's no problem about it, but yes, you are, 
definitely breaking the chain of the naming conventions. So in the LWC model, you, you can see that it is all built on the CMA6, which is also known as ES6, and it bundles the core functionality required to run the uh, lightning components and uh, this JavaScript file, this class you can import from LWC module and keep it in any of the JavaScript file that you have used. Import a statement signifies that uh, lightning component functionality is coming from the LWC module. Export default class, my component extend lightning element. This line says that you are exporting a module. Basically, you are also exporting a module, right? So in this case, your class can be the parent class of any other JavaScript class that you have. Generally, we don't keep that hierarchy in JavaScript, right? But there is a facility since you're exporting it, correct? So similar way, you can import this my component class into any other JavaScript class if you want, right? In usual cases, we don't. So for every slide probably, I have added some examples for you guys, right? So these examples are, you know, mostly we, you know, we are working in the Salesforce domain. We have seen them in one way or the other. So let me find it out for you. So this slide needs one, two, and three. So this is the code example that you can see, okay? Now, in order to execute this, we need to go back to the Visual Studio. Let me create a new project. Okay, so in this, I will create a separate project. Call it as LWC project. Okay, fine. So let me just take a pause here. Let me show you one blog and uh, then I'll explain you the steps of uh, working on different aspects of the DH. Okay, so in this blog, I'm explaining how we can install the DX for Salesforce and uh, how we can install it with the Visual Studio code as well. So the steps that we need to follow is we need to install the Visual Studio code, then we need to install the CLI, then we need to install Salesforce extension pack. We will create a test project and then authorize the one. So these are the complete steps where you can set up your DX environment to work with Salesforce Jivana. So I'm just scrolling it down slowly so that steps are self-explanatory also. First of all, I'm downloading the Visual Studio code. And uh, since my machine is 64 bit, so I install it accordingly. Then I saved it and run the installer. Once the installer is complete, I've got my Visual Studio code installed. Then I go to uh, you know, download a Salesforce CLI. Once it is downloaded, I have installed the CLI. And then once the CLI is installed, I can start working with Visual Studio Code to configure the package, the add-ons, right? So there is a package called Salesforce Extension Pack that you need to install inside the Visual Studio Code, okay? This package will provide you all the DX commands that, would, that you would be needing in order to work with Salesforce Divine. So once this is installed, you can see it this way. And in order to test your installation, go to Terminal, write a command as a DX. And once you are able to get the response like this, where it is showing what is the version of the CLI that you're working on, that means your installation is current, right? And it also gives you a variety of commands that you can use with SFDX. For creating the test Salesforce project, you need to make use of Control Shift P. That Control Shift P will give you the command palette and in the command palette, you can search for the commands related to SFDX. So if you click on Control Shift P, if you type SFDX, it gives you the list of all the commands available with your CLI that you can utilize to develop projects with Salesforce. Okay. So let me take you back to the blog. Once you are able to see all the commands, that means the CLI is installed uh, perfectly all right. Then what you need to do is you need to first create one project for yourself, okay? So there is a command called create project with manifest. Creating manifest is always, always useful because with the manifest you can leverage a lot of benefits that you can work on, uh, that you can use with DX projects, okay? 
So always create project with manifest and it will ask you what kind of project do you want? Standard template is perfectly all right. Give the name of the project that you want, provide the location where do you want to create the project. And then this will be your project template. So this is a structure that you are going to see after the project is being created. Now, project is created locally so far. Salesforce doesn't know about this project. So you need to connect your Visual Studio environment with Salesforce. So there is another command for that, which is called as authorized Salesforce on, right? If you search for in the command palette, you will see there is a command called authorize and on. You can use that command. After that, you will see, it will ask you like what kind of instance are you trying to connect with? So either you can configure it in your JSON, dot, uh, JSON file and uh, in that JSON file, it will be picked up by the project defaults. And then, or you can specify the environment and then you can specify what kind of environment are you trying to point. For production, it will always point to login.salesforce.com. For sandbox, it will always point to test.salesforce.com. If you want to use any custom URL, so you can use a custom, right? Then you have to provide the alias for your instance, for your connection. So this alias is important to understand because with the alias, you can perform a lot of other operations later and you can have multiple connections written uh, at the same time in Visual Studio code that you can identify by the alias later. So let me first authorize my Visual Studio environment with, this, with the org. So I can use authorize an org. I am actually using a developer org, so which is nothing but a production as a standalone. Let me call it as LWC training. So this is the name uh, that I'm giving to this connection, okay? Or we called it as alias. So it launches the OAuth flow and where I can select which user do I need to choose to log in, right? Now, CLI is asking permission to connect to Salesforce. And if you remember, right, we, we have connected apps in Salesforce. So this is one of the connected apps that you are right now providing the access to, okay? So I'm applying Salesforce CLI to connect with my Salesforce instance and provide the permissions to perform the respective actions. So once it is there, I can go back to console. I can see SFDX command ran successfully. And now I am able to connect my VS code environment with the Salesforce. Here you can see, we have got some outcomes that you can see if it is exit with code zero, that means it is all success and we are good to go, okay? So this is how we start with Salesforce projects. Now we need to create one LWC comp. Since we are talking about this example, right? So first of all, let me explain you what is the structure of the LWC component. How can you do that? But before that, I want you to focus on the manifest. Why I asked you to create a project with manifest? Because DX command has got some wonderful integration with the Salesforce. And if you have this package.xml with you in your manifest, you can right click and you can retrieve all the source from, the, from your instance. Right, so whatever components you configure in this package, all the components will be pulled off from the instance. So this is strategy is really important to take the backup of your development instance, where you can pull all the development artifacts into your VS Code project, and then you can check in this project into the source control, okay? So this is important for the code management perspective. So now it is really important to understand the structure of this project. Force app is the base location for all the code that you are going to have in your project. Inside that, you will be having multiple nodes, each node representing one kind of element that you have in Salesforce, right? So similarly, we have something called LWC. And inside LWC, you should keep all the LWC components only. It is, this folder structure is logical and we should follow it all the time. I think there is no problem in keeping LWC in classes as well. 
because as long as Salesforce have that file, it should work. But still, if you follow the folder structure, it will be more manageable for you later on to understand. Now, let's start with building your first Lightning Web Component. Now, I'll show you the power of the contextual search, right? If I'm clicking, right clicking on Aura, I can see all the Aura related commands that I, I can use apart from some of the generic commands, right? If I go to LWC, suddenly these commands got changed. So generic commands are all, always there. For LWC, I have only one command where I can create the LWC component, okay? So this is the beauty of having this categorization where you can categorize your code and system will help you to create the related elements in the same code. So let me create the first LWC component here. In this component, uh, let me call it as hello test comp 01. Okay. Now, did you notice as soon as you enter, the DX is asking which folder structure do you want to go? By default, it is selected the recommended folder structure for you, right? And I would strongly recommend don't change, follow it and you should see all the elements club together as, uh, as required, right? So I'll keep it default. So in the LWC folder, I can see one more uh, folder added. So in order to understand how this folder st structure looks like, you can right click on this, reveal in the file explorer. It will take you to the folder structure in the Windows Explorer where you can see how the files are being created, okay? So this project template creates you a set of folders which you can traverse using the uh, Windows Explorer. And when it is time to move your project into the bed bucket, you can move the whole project structure. Just don't make a mistake to move one file at a time, okay? It's always good to keep the folder structure as it is so that you can download it at any point of time and the project is ready to be used uh, in any other machine, all right? So you'll find the code here in the force app folder and you'll find the folder structure which is supporting the DX operations as a whole. Is this clear? When we create any LWC component, the composition is we have one HTML file which is serving as a user interface for the company. Then we will be having a JS file. In the JS file, you will be having these two lines created by default. One is the import statement, other one is the export statement. By default, the naming convention is whatever the name of your component, that will be the name of the JS class, right? So don't break this naming convention as it will be easy for everybody to understand how you're structuring your code, okay? And there, then we have got a very important file, which is called as a meta file, right? In the meta file, we will define the behavior, behavioral attributes of the uh, Lightning Web component. So you remember, uh, we have a design file in our components that helps you to create the attributes that can be exposed to the, yes, design parameter. So this is even more advanced, right? And with, with this uh, meta file, you can define what, what is the version of your uh, component, the API version that it is using, where this component should be used and whether this component can be used on the UI or not. So a lot of factors are, right? As we move forward, I'll explain you uh, this file in details and I'll show you more options that you can configure with this file, okay? So for HTML, let me just copy this code. It's, it's a very simple code that I'm, so, okay, before I added any code. So the, the HTML file for LWC components start with a template. Do you know why this is starting with a template? What is the purpose of this template? Let me explain you this uh, visually because this is really important to understand. So let me add a blank slide here. Let's suppose we have a web page, right? Generally, web pages they start like this HTML and then HTML, right? So, this is the structure of the complete lightning page. So, this is what, what we have as the lightning page. But this lightning page does not have 
only components. It can have multiple other uh, web elements. For example, if you inspect this, so this is a lightning page, right? And if I look for this, I can see a lot of HTML elements are there, correct, on this page. And that is what makes the whole structure of this page, right? So Salesforce, they have to come up with the idea on how, how they can you know, merge the components on top of the page, right? So in order to merge the HTML of the component within this page, they need to come up with something called as templates. So what LWC is doing is like they have got templates, okay? And this is one LWC component. We can have multiple LWC components, right? So once you register these templates with Salesforce as part of the deployment, Salesforce already knows that we have got the HTML snippets available with the full functionality behind it. So when you added this page using the app builder, okay, you're adding this page using app builder. Just a quick info guys, IntelliPad provides Salesforce online training mentored by industry experts. The course link is given in the description below. Now, let's continue with the session. When you added this page, this page would look like something else where you have some small boxes that we used to call as placeholders, right? For every placeholder, there is a div on the page, okay? So every placeholder is represented by one div. As soon as you drag your HTML template on top of any placeholder, this placeholder will be reflecting inside Salesforce as this, right? So basically this template is not actually a HTML node, right? It is not an HTML element. It is how Salesforce is managing the component within the web page itself, right? So let's say inside the template, you wrote paragraph and then you say, hi. So when that this HTML rendered, the final HTML would be this paragraph, or let me just copy it from here. So there'll be no template tags, only you will get the pure HTML vendor. This is how Salesforce is actually adding the templates inside the uh, overall HTML structure of the page. So that is why we are having this template attribute, because this is actually representing a template. This is not representing the actual structure, okay? Now inside this template, we can provide any valid HTML construct, right? So just ignore this message for now. I'll explain it to you, okay? So I'm using an input field here. And in the input field, this is the paradigm of so binding any property, JavaScript property with the HTML attribute. As you know, right, with HTML, we can bind the attributes with like, depending on what framework are we using. With Salesforce, this is, the, this is the paradigm that we should follow, right? So let me go back to the JavaScript file. And then in the JavaScript file, I can define this property. Right now, I'm defining a property. This is a JavaScript property. Always keep it in mind if you have experience working on Aura components, right? We used to define attributes in Aura components. So Aura components will be replaced by JavaScript properties in LWC. So whatever we were doing with Aura, uh, with attributes in Aura component, now going forward, we will have to do that with the JavaScript public property, right? So here I'm defining one property called as message. I'm providing a value to it. And then I'm mapping this property as part of data binding to the value attribute of the input. It's clear so far. Now, the point is we don't see any CSS file here, right? I would be needing one file in this structure, okay? So, for now, I'm just leaving it as it is. I just need to make sure that we see this property working somewhere. By default, meta file says that it is exposed as false. Let's make it as true first, okay? And we are not telling this meta file where to place this, where this uh, component can be placed, right? What could be the 
possible target location. So if we, if we are not providing that information, that means this component can be placed on any detail page or any lightning page that we have in Salesforce, okay? So we have HTML. In the HTML, we map the attributes with the property. That property we define inside the JS file. And then we are talking about some runtime behavior of this component. So I just change is exposed from false to true. So let me just keep it as false for a moment. Okay, now we need to first deploy. This is the beauty of DX that you already connected with the org. Now DX knows where to move the files. Okay, you don't need to do it again and again. Also notice that we have provided an alias here, right? If you click on this, I have multiple connections with other orgs as well, right? But I can still identify my current connection based on the alias that I had provided. So currently, I, you can see I am connected to LWC training, which is my training org. So this is important, and we should understand why we are actually providing the alias while configuring the problem. Okay, let me deploy it. In order to deploy this, you need to right click on that top folder, or the component top folder, and then it will give you the options, right? The one option is deploy a source to all. When you click this option, this will deploy your component to the Salesforce org. And on the terminal, you can see that three files have been created inside your Salesforce org. Okay, now let me take you to the Salesforce org in order to know which file, uh, like which, where, where do we have these files? So what we can do is we can, let's say, go to, any object, let's say accounts. I want to deploy that component on my accounts details page. So this is my accounts details page, right? So basically I want to place this component on top of the activity. So what we can do is we can click on the settings. We can click on the edit page. Once you click on it, it will open directly inside the app window, okay? App Builder is basically an in-browser declarative tool that helps you to create the lightning pages based on the components or the standard objects that we have within Salesforce, right? So on the standard components, you can see we have a lot of components already there that we can use, but we are more interested in our component, right? But I don't see my component here. So what is wrong actually? So the runtime behavior says you did not expose your component, although the files are already there with Salesforce, right? But Salesforce won't let you see it because you did not define the runtime behavior correctly, okay? So let me go back to my project. Let me make it true and redeploy. So when we redeploy it, just notice this, right? Earlier, when we created for the first time, state was created. Now, when we are deploying the files, since the files are already there on Salesforce, right? The state will be changed because you're just changing those files. The files are already created. These statements are really important to understand because it helps and keep, keep the auditing information healthy as well, okay? So let me go back to this page, Control F5. Whenever you are in Salesforce, I would always recommend you to go with Control F5, which is a hard refresh. Sometimes due to caching, we don't see the expected results. Okay, so now I should be able to see it, but I'm not able to see it yet. So what I can do is I can go back, I can give it a try, and I still don't see it, okay? So basically we can provide this, okay? So these are the targets where we can place, it, right? And then next level is to specify the targets for specific. So we can add this, click, and since I am deploying only this file, I should be able to see the whole folder as it is because it takes all the files in the folders, no matter if you're clicking on one file or the whole folder, right? So it is moving all the files in the folder to Salesforce, and then we can give it a try one second. So we have our component here. Now you remember, right, how we structure the web page for Salesforce. 
you can drag and drop this component anywhere you like, but within the placeholder section, right? So the placeholders will provide you a div functionality when the HTML renders. So you place it here, you click on save. Now it is asking you to activate the page. Do you want to activate it for the whole org or specific to a particular app, right? I'm saying make it an org default, right? This is a desktop experience. I can keep it as it is. So this is the complete review assignment that you see. The form factor remains the desktop. And then you can see we have made it system default. And this is going to be the new or default for the account detail page. Okay. So I can back and I should be able to see this. So this component is there within my web page. So this is one of the examples that we discussed. Similarly, we have more examples that we can go for. So in this, what I'm doing is I'm changing the tablet file for my component. So I'm just keep updating the same instead of creating different ones. So let's make it more rich. So now you can see I have got a div element. Inside the div, I've got multiple other div elements with more properties, okay? So we have to define these properties somehow. These all are JavaScript properties only, where, which we can define inside JavaScript, right? So if we go back here to this, inside this JavaScript properties, you can see we have this set of properties that we can define. As long as we have the properties available, we can make use of those properties in the HTML, right? So you remember the binding paradigm, right? Any valid HTML along with the data binding and the data binding comes from the JavaScript files, which is holding the property for your component, right? Right now, this is all static. We are defining some of the static property. And soon we will talk about how we can query the data from Salesforce using different mechanisms, okay? So let me save this. They're showing some error. I don't know why. This should not, yeah, I think we can save it as it is. There is no problem. So let's deploy this component. So when you deploy that component, right, you don't need to do anything else on the Salesforce because it is the same component. All you need to do is control F5 and this component should be reflected on the UI, which is not the case. We have all the files deployed successfully. Okay, let me refresh it again. No, it's not there. Click on edit. It is reflecting here, but not on the main page. So let me save it again, give it a try. Sometimes it happens, and this, hap this is happening because of the caching problem, right? Lightning Web Components uses caching all the time. So sometimes you need to go back to any other page and come back to this page again, refresh it. Control F5 should do that, but sometimes it, it won't work as well. So just be careful on that side, right? So this is our component that we have added, and uh, this is now rendering a new HTML. Okay. And then we have got another example where I'm showing you another variety of how you can build your HTML. So just notice this, right? In this, we have got some directives added. You see, if false, if true, these are called as directives, right? We can evaluate the HTML based on the JavaScript property. What it is saying that if there is a property called ready, if that property ready is equals to false, that means the component is not ready to be rendered. In that case, I'm showing one message, loading. If the property is set to true, then the loading will not be displayed and this section, this new div, which is called as display, will be displayed there, right? So you remember how we control the UI uh, in Aura component or in any other technology, right? We just need to set some of the values, then we need to make the code changes based on that value. We render the UI dynamically from within the code. In Aura framework, we have attributes to control this with the same kind of directives with some certainly a different uh, uh, different grammar on the HTML side, right? The purpose is the same. 
Here we are using the web standards. So these are the web directives that we are using if false, if true. And we are evaluating a JavaScript property. Now, in order to work with this JavaScript property, I need to make changes to my JS file as well. So what I need to do is I need to copy this. I'll explain it to you what I'm doing here. So I have added some of the properties as before. And then I have added this property. So by default, this property is false. When the component is loading for the first time, this property sets to false. And then I'm using a webhook here. So this is basically the lifecycle webhook. We will talk about it a little bit later, but for now, just try to understand. We want to showcase this property only when the component is being loaded within the HTML of the page, right? So you know the process, right? We have a full HTML. Salesforce is now trying to push the component HTML into the full HTML that we have for the page. So once this process got completed, this callback will execute automatically. Salesforce will send the client application a callback, right? And these callbacks we called as webhooks or lifecycle life webhooks, right? All right, so like, uh, you know, set timeout, right? In the set timeout, I'm just waiting for three seconds and then I am setting this property as true so that we can see this loading behavior. So instead of three seconds, let me make it six seconds, which is not a good idea, but just to showcase on how this will work. So you know the flow, right? We define this property and we are setting it to false by default. We are making sure that once the component is loaded into the HTML, right? We should be able to set this property back to true so that rest of the HTML will be displayed. So this HTML will be displayed only when the read ready property is set to true. Is it clear? Perfect. So let me deploy this code now. So we got it deployed successfully. And then in order to run this, let me navigate away from this page. And let's see, we have that behavior. Okay, let me edit this page. You can see loading, right? Let me save it. Now you can notice the component is still loading. Though it is already added to the HTML, but we exceed the timeout time for six seconds. That is why we can see that delay, okay? but it has to be instantaneous as long as the, uh, we are coding it right in the lifecycle hooks for the component. Is everybody clear? Okay. So you know about this keyword, right? So JavaScript developers are familiar already. So this keyword is all about the context. It is setting the context of your variables running within the same uh, LWC component. Okay. So when you are writing a property this way, you can see my screen uh, and you have this property, right? For example, you have declared a property error message, okay? Then you're calling this property and you're setting this property like this, this dot error message. That is setting the context of this error message property specific to the current LWC execution, okay? There is one LWC component with multiple instances. So this is going to set up the context for the current instance, which is running. So no two instance can access the error message property for each other. So it is always a good practice to make use of the contextual access to the properties. Even if you're writing this, this should work as well. But it's always good that if you're writing it, this dot something, which this will make sure that it is instance safe and no other instance can access this property while the current instance is already using it. Getting my point? Now let's talk about decorators. So I planned a scenario where I have got one parent component, which is P1, right? In that parent component, I have two subcomponents, C1 and C2, right? Inside C1, I have one more child component, which is C1 X1. This scenario is clear to everybody. So understanding composition and grouping is really important. Okay, why this is important? Because event handling will be based on this composition itself. Now, when we are talking about the events, so event will always flow like this. From, okay, so event would always flow like this. 
from child to the parent and from because this is also the parent for c1 is a child for p1 so this is how events will go from child to parent event flows from child to parent c1 x1 is a child of c1 so c1 x1 can raise a event that c1 can handle and c1 can raise a event that p1 can handle okay similarly the properties when it comes to the property only p1 can set a property that c1 can utilize and then c1 can set a property that c1 x1 can utilize so this is how we get back to the properties so i have the top level component let's say let's call it as container and i have something called pound right this is one of the component that is listing all the accounts that we have then i have something called account details and in the account list i have one more com component called as account is this composition clear so far right so in the top level container i have list of account each item in that list is representing by the account type which is a section where you can click to see the detail of that account right so what is happening is when you're clicking on the tile the account detail component will get rendered right so how this is working actually you need to understand this with two things events then properties okay so there are two things that make this whole functionality working events and properties events always go from child to parent from this way right property is always goes from parent to child we will see the demo for each and everything just try to relate it right now how the events are working for example when you click on the account type that is an event right this event will go to account list because account list is the parent right account list can handle it or can delegate it to its own parent so the good practice is to handle it uh, to delegate it to the parent itself right so account list will delegate that event to container container is the top level parent now container is going to handle that event while handling that event what container will do container will set some property right and pass on this property to account list account list pass on this property to account type or account list pass on this property to or container pass on this property to account details right so this way whatever we got it from account tile it will be delivered to account details indirectly are you clear with this scenario so now why i draw this scenario because i need to tell you about the property so how come this is actually functioning so let me define as the property called as account id okay so this property is floating from here like with every event we can pass some data so i'm passing this data as account id right on the container side i have defined one public property right this is my property prop account id okay when container receives this event with account id container set this value in the account id prop so this value would be something like this okay now you can see the property is set by the data which is coming from account type okay now this property is public right so this is a public property what does that this property is public means any of the child of this top container can utilize this property directly so now this property moves to account detail and account detail has the logic to read property and render ui so based on the account id this component can fetch the records from account data and render it on the ui okay that is the role of the public properties so just keep remember this diagram right if you are able to relate this diagram lwc is nothing actually this is all about lwc what you are looking at right now okay so this way we distribute our events and properties across the composition and the grouping of the components set we are build right this can go any deep right but the concept remains the same as long as you pick up the concept implementation doesn't matter you can go for any complex implementation at all right make sure while you start developing any component for for any functionality you should plan it on the paper first you should understand what is the parent what should be the child 
what properties do you need to expose at the parent what properties do you need to expose at the child who will generate the event who will handle the event who will who will delegate the okay so all these questions are really important to be answered beforehand before you write any line of code okay once you are done with this planning writing code is very simple so we were talking about decorator so what makes a property as a public property okay first question so we have called something called as at the rate api api again it's a class in the lwc module right so before using this decorator you need to import this class right and this is a syntax how you can import this class okay you will write import lightning element comma any decorator that you would like right so right now i'm importing api at the rate api makes any property as public if at the rate api is public what is this what kind of uh, property is this actually so what kind of this property these are some of the properties we declared right these all are private property no one except this component itself can access these properties right so these properties are just for the inter so make sure when you have to define the public properties always use at the rate api if you are not defining it that means it is a private property by default clear few of the available decorators as api wire and track track is no longer in use so you don't need to track by default all the properties are reactive right i'll explain you what is a reactive property now okay so let's come back to this diagram once again first uh, you are clear with the property right public properties right so public properties they are public uh, by making use of at the rate api right so these are some of the points that you can understand about the public properties where public properties are used by any of the components that is defined as a child right if a parent is defining a property child can consume that property right these properties are reactive what does that means it means that framework observe these property for changes for example we are talking about account id so let's say this account id has got a value first time i click on a tile the account id property sets to 100 right and the same property will move everywhere and this account detail component is also bind with the property value account detail will react on the property id as 100 correct now as soon as i click on any other tile the property value got changed let's say 101 so we don't need to do anything about it right you just need to click on the tile and since this property is reactive and it is bind to other child elements framework will propagate this property value to the parent parent will propagate this property value to the child and whosoever is a child they found it that this property value got changed so they are forced to fetch the new record and they will bind it to the ui this is all done as wired a functionality by the framework you don't need to worry about that is a beauty of the lwc framework right for example apart from this account details if i have something called the instead of this property account id let's say account name for example okay i'm passing this property for instance abc so this account name property now change to this and based on the name i'm rendering the ui okay so what we can do is Yes, we have another component which is called a add account, right? Now, what is happening is this add account is creating the account, or let's say update account would be an easy one. So, update account. So, this component is also using this property account, correct? But when this property, this this component has a user interface where users can modify this property to something new, okay? So, let's say. they modify this property from the ui they are modifying basically the user interface and the user interface is bind with this property and property new value is x1001 right so this is generated by some other component this is modified by some other component but since this property is reactive already all the components in the group will be updated automatically right so as soon as you update the account here account details automatically refresh to show this since you are binding to the same property if you don't want this property to affect others just make it make it a different property altogether 
which is not used by accountants. You're getting my point? And that is the reason why do we need to have a clear association of the uh, components and why do we need to have a logical grouping? Because as long as you are grouping them as per the functionality, they should, the, the handling task and, or the maintenance task would be very less. Okay. So this is one of the examples and uh, we were talking about the API property. So all the public properties are reactive by default, right? So the lightning web component only feel that a component of a decorate with API are publicly available to the consumer as object property. So if you don't define it as at the rate API, that means it is not available outside the current component, right? It is private property, okay? So in order to implement this, let me take you to this example. So I have, I'm going to add one more component here or I can use the same component, right? So basically, and let me get one more component. So I would be needing a container component first. So let me call it as lightning component, container component, yes. So I have added a container component first, right? In the container component, I have this HTML, which is black. Now I need a child component. So I am creating this bike.html. So let me create this component as let's say bike. So this is uh, this is another component. So far it is independent of anything. But now I am updating the HTML of the container component. So this is how we refer to a child component here. Just keep it in mind the naming convention here is different than what we have in if, uh, or of frame. Right. This is the name of the namespace. So C is the namespace. Dash is a convention that you need to follow. Bike is the name of the folder that is actually holding the component. Okay. So just make sure that bike is the name of the folder here. And that's how you refer to a component. Namespace slash the folder that contains the component. Okay. This is a naming convention that you should follow. Just a quick info, guys. IntelliPad provides Salesforce online training mentored by industry experts. The course link is given in the description below. Now, let's continue with the session. Now, this bike is a, this is a property. We have to define this property first. Okay. So, what I can do is, I can go to the app.js file, which is basically the container.js file in our case. So in the JS file, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to define this property. Okay. Now, this property is available within the parent. And then I have the template for the child. So I'm adding this to the template for the child. Okay. In this template, I have one image and then I have one paragraph. Now, I'm defining this as a public property for the child. Okay. That's it. Uh, before defining it, I need to import this property. Right? Import the class where I can get this directive at the red API. That makes my property as public. Now try to understand what is happening, right? In that container, I have a public property. Okay? I have a public property that I define. This is my property. This is my private property that I have defined. From the HTML itself, I am calling a component. And then from the component, I am picking up any public property that is defined by the component. Since this component defined this property, Right, I can use it in another component, which is a parent component. You're getting my point, right? The parent component define a private property and child component define a public property. Why do we need a public property in child? Because we are calling child from a parent. And by calling, I need to pass the data from parent to the child, right? So what we have to do is we have to define a property for the child, which should be public, that can be accessed by the parent. So here, Parent is accessing that property. Now, when we are passing this value to this property, this property becomes an object, okay? Because we define this property as a JSON object, if you notice. So this is a JSON object, right? So it's whatever structure of this object is, right? The public property will become like that. So when you're passing this through to the public property, the public property now becomes a JSON object, okay? And when this property goes back to the child component, we can access this property since this is now an object, property dot name of the child of that object. In that object, we define name 
and picture, right? These are the two attributes. So here, same way we can define, we can use bike.picture, which is the attribute of the object itself and then bike.name. So this way we are transferring the data from parent to child. This is how we build this component. So let me deploy this. So I would be needing my container. I mean, deploy this to... So uh, I wanted to show you this. Whenever you're trying to deploy any container component, right? Make sure all the child components are deployed first. Otherwise, Salesforce won't let you deploy this container component. Okay, so we need to make sure that all the child components should go first, then the container component. Now it is very hard, you know, when we have nested component, how would we get to know which component should deploy first, right? It is a real channel. So what you need to do is, you need to go back to your manifest, click here, and since it is already having your Apex components and then LWC component bundles, everything is already there. So right click here, deploy a source in manifest to or and this will deploy everything that you want to deploy. But make sure that uh, your package should have only those elements that you really want to deploy, okay? Otherwise, this could be a problem. Now, let me show this to you on the user interface. Let me go to accounts again. I can find any account page. I can edit that page. Okay, now I need to go and check, oh, my component is not there because I did not configure this file. So I need to expose it to true. Also, I would like to expose it to the lightning pages. I can go here, expose it to the lightning pages. And since already all the components are already there, I can deploy it directly. And now I can refresh this. Okay, so I can see only container component. Why, why I'm only looking at the container component? Where is my bike component? Right now, I did not expose this bike component to be used as a standalone, okay? Because it is not truly a reusable component. I want this component to be used, but from within container component itself. That is why I keep it as private and I, I allowed it to be used from within the container account. This is one of the design pattern that you need to understand. Though you have two different components, but you can still control their runtime behavior, whether they will be visible or not, okay? So if you go to your planning page, you will understand whether this component need to be exposed independently or not. If not, then it's better to keep it private and let the container be exposed in container uh, to use this component, okay? So these are called public and private components as well sometimes as part of the convention. So you can create the public components as well as private components this way, okay? So let me drag and drop this component on top of here. So this is my component and I can save it. And now I can see this, okay? Now, let me show you one more thing. This is one more variant that I would like to show. Let's say I am exposing my bike component as well. Now, what will happen? There is no harm, right? But will that work? Let me see. Okay. So let's give it a try. I'm just editing this page. Now I should be able to see my bike component as well, which is there. Let me drag and drop this component. We couldn't display by, cannot read the property of undefined, okay? So we cannot set it up like this, since it requires a property to work, right? You should understand which component needs to be, needs to expose. Everybody is clear? Okay, perfect. So, okay, so basically, when we are talking about the life cycle behavior of any software component, right? It is driven by two things, the properties, and the events. Properties is are the data, basically, which is persisted with the component itself. And the events, they are the reactivity of the software component, right? So you have heard of some, some components, they are very reactive because they triggers events for almost every, every scenario, right? So there are some of the, if you have heard of event buses, right? 
So Kafka is one of the solution which is handling the event buses. Every every big software vendor, software vendor has got its own event bus. So every software component is driven by the event. Event is the external touch point that a software can expose to interact with the users, right? Unless software don't expose that touch point, external world cannot feel that software, cannot use that software, cannot test the reactivity for that software, okay? In Salesforce LWC, event handling is somewhat a different thing altogether than what we uh, natively do, right? In LWC, the events generated by the component is not handled by the component itself. It is already, it, it, it will always be delegated to the component, which is in the in the upper side of the hierarchy of the component tree, right? So how this work actually, let me give you one example. We have two components, one child component, other one is parent component. So if a user, let's consider this is a tile component, right? So if a user clicks, on this components component, right? Then this generates an event. This click is basically the UI action, which is mapped by an underlying event handler. So for the click, let's say we have something called on click attribute that uh, allows you to define the handler, okay? Now in regular softwares, in regular processes, in regular components, what we generally do is when we have the on click or any kind of event generating by the source, which is the child component here, the handler would be present locally. So we call it as local handlers, okay? So we generally have the local handlers available to handle the event, right? And in that case, they write some kind of routine that will be executed once this local handler triggers the process. So, some kind of routine that we have. And this routine will be executed once the local handler triggers the process, okay? In simple words, when a component issue the event, there has to be a local handler to receive that event and to handle that event, that local handler should have a routine, okay? This is how the regular software development work with Salesforce LWC, there is a difference. So with LWC, we don't have these routines, right? We don't have the, these routines. Instead, we have delegation or delegates. So we have delegates, right? So these delegates have the responsibility to move the event along with the event data to the upper side of the hierarchy. So parent is at the top, child is at the bottom, right? So in that case, this hierarchy would be child will always delegate the event to the parent. Along with the event, it also sends event data, okay? So that parent can pick this up, parent can understand what was the event and what was the event data that was exposed during that event, right? Based on this, parent sets some property. Parent has a responsibility to evaluate the event. And then it also has a responsibility to set properties. And then these properties can flow from parent to child, okay? So these properties will flow from parent to child. So this is the architecture that you should always follow. Now, point is, even if you write the code as a regular routine here, you're not sending the event back to your parent, right? This code is still working, local routine. So this code will work. There is no problem with this code, right? But as part of the best practice and as part of the design patterns that is suggested by Salesforce, we should always move the events to the top layer so that top layer can handle it once and pass on the properties to all the child elements. You can try to understand it this way. If, let me see, so what is the benefit of this approach is I have a parent and then I have few of the childs, all right? So what is happening is, why do we have this design pattern? Because if child is working on the data locally, if this is a local execution, right? If I am modifying this data locally, then only I have the access to this data. 
right? No other component will have the access to this data. The problem here is they all need to write down the same layer to process the local routines. Though they are working on the same data, right? But since they are working locally in silos, they have to work independently. They have to work again and again for the same logic, right? That means we are replicating the logic for no reason. And this is a cause of overall slowdown of the performance. So this is actually a performance set. Now, let's change the idea. So instead, we process it locally. What we said is, okay, whenever you have any kind of event, right? No matter what, you can pass it on to me. I will take care of the events. So I will give you the opportunity to pass the events to me and then I will process it for you, okay? These all are the events that child is given, giving back to parent. Now, what is the responsibility of parent? The responsibility of parent to store the metadata required for the process. Parent has got property where, because parent has access to all the public properties for all the child component. So let's say for this child, I have property one. For this one, I have property two. For this one, I have property three, then property four. So being a parent of all the child components, parent has got access to P1, P2, 3, P4. It is not just property, right? If component, child component one has got method one, right? So this method one can be accessed by the parent and the parent has access to all the public methods that we define for any of the child components. We will discuss this all in real demos. For right now, I just want you to focus on the concept, okay? So parent also has the access to all the public methods. So what we are achieving out of here is that we are maintaining common processing layer at the parent. Parent is processing all the events and then parent is processing the respective properties based on the event data. And this these properties are now sharing back to the components. Whether they subscribe it or not, these properties are available with them as long as they want to consume it, okay? So this is how we are defining the properties and events. Events we always define at the child and these events will bubble up in the hierarchy move back to the parent. Parent has a responsibility to process these events. And then parent has a responsibility to provide the properties required by each of the child. Since parent has got access to all the public properties, all the public methods from any of the child defined under the hierarchy. Okay, that is why the logical composition is important. If you just keep them as a separate component, there will be no communication between them, right? For that, you need to develop an infrastructure so that these two independent components can work together. But here, Salesforce LWC is providing you the whole framework that is actually enabling that communication without even letting you code for anything, okay? So this is the core concept of events and property, right? Now I'll show you some of the examples where I'll, I'll explain it to you. How do you actually work with these properties and public functions, okay? So let me log into my VM. So for the sake of this demo, I've created one lightning page, right? That lightning page is basically available as the app. I created the tab for that. So light LWC training session. This is the page that I have, okay? So now, first of all, let me add one component here. So this is the API property. I'm saving it. So we'll go reverse this time. I'll show you one demo, then I'll explain to you explain the code to you so that you can understand the implementation. Can you see this component here, right? This component has got two components available. One is the parent, other one is the child, right? In the parent, I am having a percentage box where I can define the percentage. And according to that, the child is reacting, okay? So how this is happening actually? So let me explain this to you with this code. For the parent, I am basically using this HTML, right? In that, you can see I have a lightning input available and then I have a child component. For the child component, I am passing this property to the child component and parent is defining this property as this file. For right now, just don't think about this event. We'll talk about it later. 
Okay, we have defined a private property that I am passing to the passing to the child component. Okay, and in that child component, if I explore this, in the child component, it is nothing. I am just setting up some HTML using that property. But how come I am receiving that property? Because I am actually de declaring it as a public property, right? Now the good part about it is you can set these public property values with any kind of formatting. So this is the you know format function that you can apply, right? Dollar places the HTML, uh, the JavaScript variable, and then you can surround it or concatenate it with any string that you need. Basically, it is working smartly here for the style attribute. It is building it up as a dynamic JavaScript variable, and since it is a reactive property as I told you yesterday. So anytime we are changing this value, system is rewriting the whole content, correct? System is rewriting this whole content. And accordingly, this width attribute is getting set by the property calculation, okay? So this is what we called as how the defining the public property, right? Now I'll show you one more example. We will come to the events after this, right? So I'm just removing this one. And then I'm adding another component for you. In this component, I will show you how you can access a public function from parent, right? Public function is defined at the child level, but we can access it from the parent. This button is in the parent HTML. The functionality that this button is performing is refreshing the clock. And to refresh the clock, we have a function which is public in child component. Every time I click on this, you can see it is actually changing the clock time, right? So now what is happening in the back? The API method, you can see, I have something called handle refresh, right? On the button key. If I go to the JS function, handle refresh is doing nothing, right? It is making use of the query selector. So just take a note of this, how you can select the DOM components. So just like in jQuery, we have a DOM selector, right? In LWC, they have a, a, a customary selectors defined. One is the query selector, where you can query all the LWC component present in the DOM. So here I am querying the LWC component, which is present as my child, right? And after getting this handle, I can call any public function available with that component. So if I go to clock, I can see there is a public function defined for this. So this way you can define a public function as well as a public property. So getting my point, the purpose of this is it will query the component present in the DOM anywhere. As long as that component is available in the DOM, this template query selector will pick up that component and it gives you the handle to call any public method defined by that component. You're getting this? So these are the public properties and public functions, public methods, right? Now let's talk about the events. In the events, you can have, for example, we have some standard events, right? Click, change, blur. These are all standard events. LWC supports both standard and custom. So we will look for both custom standard and custom events today, right? So now what is happening is we have to develop a functionality where we need to make one of the element on the UI reactive. So while working with those such scenarios, we need to provide the events for those elements. Now we, in this case, we need to change the, you know, change the child component if the value in the parent component changes. This is usually what happens, right? If we have the user interface, if the users are input, going to input any data, we need to make this data reactive so that the other child components can work, right? So if you follow this paradigm, parent is always setting the properties for the child, right? Parent is always processing the events for the child, setting up the properties, passing the properties back to the child, right? So this is what is happening here. I have the property, parent has a property, that is actually a private property, but it has nothing to do because nobody is going to call this property from anywhere. But parent has got a child method and this child method has got one property which is bind with the 
with some kind of a logic. So child has to define this property and then we are passing this property to the child. But on what basis? What is the trigger, right? So we have to define the trigger here in terms of the event. So trigger is on change and the handler for the trigger is the local event handler. So when you go back to the property.js, you can see we have a local event handler. Here. And since this is a parent, it is not delegating any event to anybody. It is handling this event right away, correct? I'll show you cases where the child is actually generating the event and it is moving up to the parent and how this is being uh, used. So in this case, parent is getting the event and it is now processing the event, setting up the property. Property is bind with the child already. So once we are done with this setup, we don't need to change anything because these properties are already reacted. We don't need to tell the framework to reload the child component when the property changes. Since this property is reactive, this property is marked with at the rate API, which is public property, it is already reactive by default. So framework knows when this property changes, what is the source of this property? Parent. When the parent is changing this property, render all the child who are using this property at the moment. Okay. So we are clear with the events. We are, this is a standard event actually. Right? This is not the custom event. This is a standard event so far. So this event is provided by the element itself. Right? Now, let me explain it to you about the events, events and their, their properties and their attributes. Okay? So let me first set up this. So let's talk about the simple event. Right? So this is a paginator control. Right? It's a simple paginator control. And I click on these buttons so you can see I have a label which is changing, right? So label is part of the parent and the events are being generated by the child, okay? So this is a scenario. I have a child control that is basically taking care of all the events to change the label, right? Then label itself is a property. So now, why? how this is happening? So if you go to, so in this, event simple.html, you can see I have a div. Inside the div, I have a paginator control, right? In the paginator control, I have this HTML. I have only two buttons, next and the previous, right? For every button, I have got standard event handlers assigned to it, right? So we have got standard triggers here and the local event handlers are there. So what is happening is if I go to JS, for each local event handler, I am doing something called dispatching the custom events. Now, this is very tricky. You need to understand it carefully. When you need to you know, trigger the events from child to parent, you need to create a custom event all the time. If you're using a standard event that has a local event handler, that is fine. But if you need to send the event from child to parent, you will always have to create a custom event, right? Dispatch event is the function that will fire that event for you on behalf of the child, okay? This line, this dot dispatch event, this line tells the framework that this child has issued a custom event for the parent, right? Whosoever, is the next immediate parent to this child component has to handle this event. And then that child can propagate that event higher in the hierarchy that we have for the component. Now, the key point here is, how do we refer these events in the parent class? So let me pull this up, this one too. Can you notice what is the name of the event here? On previous, right? And what is the name of the event that we have generated previous, correct? So this is a convention that you must follow when you are generating the event with whatever name, correct? While assigning that event in the parent HTML, you need to add a prefix on before that. So the previous becomes on previous, next become on next. So this is something which is tricky, but with the practice, you guys can understand it easily, right? So we are generating an event here from child, right? 
saying that okay next button was clicked previous button was clicked right but when we have to refer this event in the parent html we have to add on before it so that the html would get to know that this is a previous event generated by this child count right this is not a standard event and this is not a standard component as well lightning input is called as a standard component that is also a component but that is a standard component this is your custom component and for the, your component you are defining the events that you want to be exposed so this way we can pass on the event from the child to the parent now what happened when the parent is going to handle this event what will happen if you go to the parent js so in the parent js we have something called handle previous which is the local event handler for the parent so we have generated these events from the child it come comes back to the parent parent assign a local event handler to these custom events now these events are being handled by parent actually this is the code where we are handling the events we could write these we could write this code directly into the child as well but as i showed you this design pattern will get failed right we cannot write anything directly inside the component itself otherwise it will always start working in the silos and there is no point of putting it up in the component tree so setting up the component tree is important because events will go from child to parent properties will come from parent to child just a quick info guys intellipad provides salesforce online training mentored by industry experts the course link is given in the description below now let's continue with the session right this is a design paradigm so parent has got some local event handlers and in the local event handlers parent can write down the logic that is required for the functionality and parent also has a property right which parent is setting up and if you notice in the paginator we are actually parent is not sending any property why because we are using that property directly into the parent if we need to send this property back to the child okay we can for example you can modify it as a little bit right so you can always play with these things like this right what i can do is i can in the page layout i can copy this from here so let me have this property Uh, let me put it outside this right so this is random html that i have right so right now i am using this property in the page uh, in in the page generator control itself in order to make it available what i need to do is i need to make this property as public first right and once this property is available as public i can do one thing i can pass this property here as page equal to this is actually the auto complete so we have this page property set there now i am passing this page property to the page generator and in the page generator i am consuming this page property okay so this way i can pass on the property to the child control as well so let me deploy it quickly and see if this is working fine so okay it's already there so let me right so we can see we have a new component here a new uh, label here and if i keep clicking on these buttons this will set the property for both for parent and the child so this way you can propagate the events as well as the properties to and fro is this clear to everybody okay so i'll give you one more example so that you guys can have a better understanding on this just a minute let me remove this and now try to understand this one this is relatively simple so i am getting this data from contact correct this data has got a parent and a child so parent is the the top top level container having a child the contact list item i am putting it inside a for loop so that for every contact record we have this rendered once right when i click on this it is showing me the details right 
So let me explain it, explain it to you. First of all, I will go to this top level parent. So this is my top level parent, right? In my top level parent, you see, I have got one for loop, right? Inside this for loop, I am adding one child component, okay? Apart from that, I am also having other HTML element in the parent itself. So there is no problem in that, right? We can have any valid HTML apart from the child controls. Getting my point? And then I have this component, which is my child component. So this component contains simple HTML where it is showing that uh, image and some data about the content, right? Now what is happening is when anybody is clicking on the child, right? So the click element of the child is this anchor tag. So if you notice in the anchor tag, I have something called on click event, which I'm handling locally, right? And I was talking about the anchor tag, right? Well, how should we handle this? So mm -hmm. there's something called event dot prevent default. You should always call this function when you want to avoid the standard behavior of any element. Because Anchor has a standard behavior to redirect the page. It, it will post back your page, correct? Now, when the user is clicking on that hyperlink or the Anchor tag, I am preventing the default behavior, first thing. Also, I am creating a event by the name select. And with this event, I am passing the ID of the content, right? So this way, event will have the data as well event is going up to the parent with the data. Now the parent will evaluate this event and find out what data do we have with the event. So whosoever contact I click, I will be getting a different contact ID every time, right? And with each contact ID, I'm creating one event and I'm sending it to the parent. Clear so far? Okay. Now, when child is sending the event with data to the parent, what is happening at the parent side? So on the parent, I'm saying that first on select, you remember we are sending the event by the name select. It should be defined as on select when we are referring in the HTML of the parent, right? This is telling me that when the child is sending me this event, have this event handler that will handle this event. This event handler is defined here, right? In this event handler, I can retrieve the data, which is coming with the event, okay? And based on this data, I can process the logic here, right? Since I'm already having a contact object, how this is coming, just leave it for now. I'm trying to find the context based on this ID. So this could be any valid logic that you have. Once you have this ID, then you can set it to the selected contact property, right? This is defined at the parent. Now what is happening is parent is passing this information or using this information somewhere, okay? So we have a component. They, they haven't defined the component, that's fine. You can define a component and pass this value to that component. So this is your detail part, right? Once you have the property available at parent, you can pass it on to anywhere. So you notice this, right? When I'm clicking it, it is sending to the parent, parent is processing this, finding the data for the contact, and then we are displaying that data in the HTML of the same component or the different component, doesn't matter. What is Salesforce? Uh, from a layman's terminology, and then get into understanding of uh, what is uh, Salesforce uh, thing and what is uh, Salesforce admin who's going to do so. That's what we are going to learn. All right, let's go ahead. Um, what is CRM? Okay, so CRM stands for uh, Customer Relationship Management. Okay, so what is Customer Relationship Management? All right, so this is uh, a process. Okay, Customer Relationship Management, aka CRM. Uh, Okay, this is a process in which an organization tries to keep its interaction alive with, it may be a customer, it may be a prospective customer, and it may be 
uh, someone who is trying to help uh, the organization in acquiring customers. So in multiple dimensions, uh, uh, the CRM is going to help the organization. Okay. And uh, at this point in time, it's just not interacting with the customers or it is not interacting with the prospective customers or it's not just interacting with the other team members who bring in customers or prospective customers. Uh, what CRM can do is uh, CRM has got some good uh, data management capabilities also. So it has a nice uh, way to segregate the customer data and keep it for easy retrieval. That is one thing. And then uh, Salesforce also ensures that uh, you can have the employee structure designed in the Salesforce application so that the right people will see the right data. Okay, it doesn't allow anybody who is not required to see any data, they will not see that. So that is another interesting thing about CRM. And then if you call up Amazon, all right. Now, Amazon guys pick up your call, they will have all your details over there. And then they will uh, say that, uh, uh, hey, this is your order, you did a, uh, you did a, a free pickup uh, from a location from you. So would you prefer changing it to something else? So all those details they give to you in a very nice manner as if they are interacting with you uh, and they know which order you have placed and all the other things. The reason for that is Salesforce is behind that. Or uh, let's say if you call up a McDonald's uh, customer care for ordering a burger for you. So they immediately pick up your call and say, hey, um, XYZ, you have ordered a, a double patty chicken uh, burger last time. Would you prefer to do this? So how is all that things known to them? That's all because of the Salesforce as a CRM, which is running their entire customer service. All right. Now there are uh, multiple types of CRM that are available uh, across the globe. So first one is a strategic CRM. The second one is an operational CRM. Third one is analytical CRM. Fourth one is collaborative CRM. So what is a strategic CRM? Or what is operational CRM? So when you are talking about strategic CRM or a collaborative CRM, both are almost one at the same strategic CRM or the collaborative CRM, both are one at the same. All right. Now here, they are meant for a specific uh, uh, targeting. Okay. Like, let's say if you have to run a campaign. Okay. Now, what is a campaign? A campaign is like uh, advertising uh, your products. Now, Let's take the example. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody are joining from India, but uh, all of you might have heard the, the bank HDFC, right? So HDFC bank has got uh, a number of credit cards. Now, one of the credit card is uh, 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 like a top-notch credit card is there. It may be from HDFC or it may be from Amex or it may be from Bank of America or maybe from Citibank. Let's not bother about which bank it is. Now, it has launched a new credit card and that credit card has to go to not everybody. It should not be given to every Tom, Dick and Harry in the globe. It has to be given to only those customers who are having a platinum preferred card or uh, there is something called as uh, 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 there is another card like uh, Xperia card is there. So all those who are having an Xperia card or a platinum preferred card, they would like to offer this card. So they are already customers for that particular bank and then still they want to give it uh, only to those people. So what they do is uh, strategically, okay, they do a campaign by extracting the data, by extracting the data that is only meant 
for these uh, preferred customers and then they send out emails or they send out some uh, messages or something so that only those guys will be getting that particular mailer. So that would be, uh, all these things will be a part of the strategic CRM. I've just given one example. There are a lot, lot more things that we do. Okay, and a collaborative CRM also works on the same lines, okay? Okay, a collaborative thing also works on the same lines. Now, coming down to the operational CRM. So operational CRM is the regular CRM. Uh, create a account, create a customer, create a lead, okay, sell a product to a existing customer or convert a lead or lead is a prospective customer. So convert a lead to a different uh, level, uh, convert an opportunity to closed or convert an opportunity to closed lost, closed one. So whatever the daily activities that you do in sales and service operations, that will all be taken care by the operational CRM. And then we have something known as an analytical CRM. Now, analytical CRM works with all the other CRMs, okay? So when you look at analytical CRM, again, analytical CRM is very, very niche area. Okay, it is not that everybody can uh, uh, can buy a license for analytical CRM because it is an expensive license. And what is that it is going to do? It is going to do the, uh, you have all the data, right? So in the previous slide, we looked at uh, Salesforce uh, keeps track of the customer data, right? It nicely manages all the data. So analytical CRM pulls out that data and then it is capable of slicing and dicing the data in a way that is uh, required by the, the anal analysis team and the analysts have got options to pass in few parameters into this analytical CRM and based on that, they will get the details of it. Now, this analytical CRM, let me give you an example. Like, how did I do? Okay. So, let's say uh, you have this uh, shopping festivals that would be offered by Amazon or Flipkart or uh, something like that, right? The big billion day sale or something. So, if I have to take that as an example, how was my big billion dollar sale? in 2021 versus 2020. Now, how much did I spend on advertisements or on campaign for the billion, big billion dollar a day sale in 2021 versus the, the sale that has happened versus the amount spent on campaign for big billion dollar a day sale in 2020 versus the sale in 2020. What were the number of opportunities that I had in Q4 2021 versus the opportunities that I had in 2020? Uh, what is the percentage rise in the opportunities? What is the per per percentage decline in the opportunities? Okay. Otherwise, there may be another example. How many opportunities were I able to close in year 2021 versus year 2020? So all these analysis can be done using the analytical CRM. And uh, the best thing is uh, Salesforce had now come up with an AI concept for that. They call it as Einstein Analytics. So that is also going to do some uh, predictive analysis saying that these are the things that you did uh, uh, in the last year campaign, which resulted in this, and it is going to run through some, uh, even I'm not completely aware of it. There are some uh, machine learning uh, AI related tools, uh, which are uh, intertwined with this Einstein capabilities in Salesforce. So it is going to suggest certain um, ways and means to do the 
campaigns. So that is also is an additional tool that is being offered by Salesforce at a premium. All right. So these are the various types of CRMs that you have. Uh, and uh, if you look at Salesforce as a CRM, it has got multiple things like we discussed all those things. So the customer service is one thing that we are looking at then analytics, uh, the one which we discussed right now is another one commerce, the business that you do. Okay. So Salesforce had come up with its own uh, new uh, tools for running this commerce Salesforce uh, B2B commerce, B2C commerce. So Salesforce business to business commerce, uh, Salesforce commerce B2B is the name of the tool or Salesforce commerce B2C is the name of the tool. Then uh, automation, we can automate uh, various Salesforce tasks either by using workflows or by using flows or by using uh, process builders. And then if I require, uh, by default, Salesforce offers you three applications, sales, service, and marketing. Now, on top of the sales, service, and marketing, if you want to have another application to sell your insurance uh, uh, or to settle any insurance claims, for settling insurance claims, Salesforce doesn't have any application. So you would like to build one Salesforce application for uh, uh, claim settlements. So for that, you can use Salesforce platform to do an application uh, for settling of all the claims. That's also possible from the application development. So coming down to specifics of a job role. So the job role that we are looking at over here is a Salesforce admin and what is he supposed to do? So if a new user joins in an organization, okay, already there is a Salesforce implementation and this Salesforce implementation is already there and some there is a Salesforce administrator. So a new sales rep has joined or uh, a new manager has joined for both sales and service uh, teams. So this guy has to see few data, few details from the sales uh, application. This guy has to see few details from the service application. So I need to create a new user profile which caters to that requirement. So then people will come to you or else uh, when you are looking at the sales people, you are supposed to see what are the details that the, what are the level of uh, granularity that a particular user has got access to and is it uh, right enough access or does he require more granular access or should you reduce the granularity in access that you have to discuss with the business analyst and the salesforce technical architect and then based on their uh, uh, inputs, you will be able to change their access levels. And then again, every day, you will have new leads, uh, new accounts, new contacts, uh, some new data is going to come in from various sources. So one of the things is that um, uh, you have to import all the data that is coming in. And then you can run duplication tools to ensure that no a deduplication of data has to be done. And then uh, uh, you can check for the updates from salesforce.com, but that is not a very, very large uh, piece of your work, okay? The first four uh, uh, and the last one, manage customers, users, and employees. Uh, so those are the five things that you do on a day in and day out basis. But again, on a lighter side, okay, this is purely on the lighter side, which is a very easy task. And uh, there was a survey that was done by Salesforce and 65% uh, uh, of the Salesforce admins has listed a task, the task that they are doing on a daily basis. And that task is password reset that is not given over here, but that is the top task 
that a Salesforce administrator is going to perform. So the, this is a, the result of a survey that has been uh, run earlier in uh, US market. And then 65% of the people who responded said that password reset is one of their top uh, jobs or top tasks for them. So though it seems to be simple, uh, but again, this is the top task that you have to do. And then coming down, so let's say you're applying for your jobs, okay? You completed your Salesforce uh, admin uh, related training and then you're applying for a job. And when you're applying for a job, uh, people will look at a certification. So the certifications that you would be doing will be uh, Salesforce administration uh, certification, which is called EDM201 as per the Salesforce uh, nomenclature. And then <clears throat> you should be able to understand the entire Salesforce uh, uh, landscape. When I say Salesforce landscape, that includes user data, security, uh, the customization of uh, the sales cloud and service cloud. Okay. And then you have uh, reports, dashboards, workflows that needs to be built. So number of questions would be 60, time for completion is 105 minutes, passing percentage is 65, exam fee is $200. Let's not talk about retake fee because everybody passes after this IntelliPad course. Okay. Don't think about a retake here. So Salesforce admin exam, what are the topics that you have? So if you are looking at a Salesforce admin exam topics, you have organizational setup, you have user setup, security and access, um, then you have standard and custom objects. So again, if we are going, uh, if we are going into the topic, so what happens is uh, whenever a Salesforce application license has been procured, this will be procured by a company. Let's say, for example, McDonald's is the company over here. Okay, the reason why I'm taking the name of McDonald's or Amazon is because they both are large customers uh, uh, who directly interact with the customers because they are the people who interact with you. If I take, uh, if I have to take an example, uh, I can take an example of Walt Disney or I can take an example of uh, Coca-Cola. But again, you don't interact on a daily basis with Walt Disney or Coca-Cola. You interact on a daily basis with Amazon or, uh, uh, or McDonald's. So that is, a, that is where the interaction, uh, you have that interaction and that interaction is facilitated by Salesforce. So when McDonald's buys the license for Salesforce, how McDonald's as an organization has McDonald's as an organization has been set up in Salesforce or how Amazon has been set up in a Salesforce like that, whatever company buys the Salesforce application, that organization setup has to be done. And then when you come down to user setup, when you come down to the user setup, who will be what? So there will be administrators, there will be end users, there will be uh, different kinds of users. So which user should see what is taken care by the security and access. Now, as I told you earlier, Salesforce gives you, Salesforce gives you three applications. One is sales, service and marketing, okay? And then I have also told you that claim process, okay? The, uh, the insurance claim uh, process is uh, another application that you built by yourself. So anything that is given to you by Salesforce will fall under uh, standard and anything that you build will fall under custom. So whatever the entities that you build are standard entities and custom entities. And then you have, I told you, sales and marketing and service are the applications that are given to you by Salesforce. So we will be discussing about all those things and they are a part of the exam also. And don't worry about it. In the next slide, we shall see how much percentage of these things will come. Okay. And then when, 
someone uh, uh, requests uh, for uh, a license or if someone wants to buy, let's say your company is selling some laptops. And if someone wants to buy a laptop and this request has come from a particular area and you have a sales rep sitting down over there to take care of these requirements. So what happens is you have to assign this request to that particular sales rep and then define an activity for that person to go talk to that requester and then come back with a result on that particular request. So that is going to be coming under activity management and collaboration. And then you have the data management. So how do you import data? How do you export data? How do you backup data? All that falls under data management. And then you create reports and dashboards for the users. When I say analytics, reports and dashboards, Salesforce, out of the box, uh, reports and dashboards are not very, very powerful. So you have to buy an additional license, which is a Tableau license or Salesforce Einstein analytics is what you call it now. So you got to buy an additional license to get the additional power and other things. But for the Salesforce certification exam, it's enough. Whatever the basic reports, uh, there are four kinds of reports that are there and one dashboard that will be available. You, If you learn those things, that would be a good for you. And then you have workflow process and automation where we'll be talking about uh, workflows, process builder and approval process. And then whenever you are uh, trying to build an application, okay, uh, how do you build an application for a desktop and how do you build it for a mobile application? And uh, also in Salesforce, uh, uh, you have something called as App Exchange. So App Exchange is like a marketplace. What do I mean by a marketplace? If you have to download any software on your uh, Android or iOS phone, right? So you will either go to an app store or a play store and you download it. Similarly, Salesforce also has a number of products like that, which are developed by other developers. And if you want to develop, if you want to download them and use them, some of them are free, some of them are paid. So if you want to do them, App Exchange is the marketplace from where you can get those things. Just a quick info, guys. IntelliPad provides Salesforce online training mentored by industry experts. The course link is given in the description below. Now, let's continue with the session. So again, if you look at it, organization setup, user setup. So the most important uh, topics are security and access, standard and custom object, sales, marketing, service and support. So all these things, if you put together, this comes up to 100%. Okay. And again, so these are all uh, the things which, uh, these are the marks, not marks distribution per se, the number of questions. So uh, in the before slide, we have seen you have 60 questions and you need to come up with uh, uh, 39 uh, answers, right? So 3% of the questions are from organizational setup. 7% of the questions are from user setup. That is how these things will be there. There are a few questions in question and answer pane and uh, chat window. I will respond to them in some time. Just give me two minutes. Okay, so how do you prepare for this certification exam? First and a foremost thing, you have to be thorough with all the basics. And then uh, whatever the, the duration and the mark distribution that is given here, you need to ensure that you prepare according to that. And then uh, uh, you have to practice okay you have to practice and then uh, you need to concentrate more on the area that has more weightage and uh, you have various mock tests that are available uh, uh, on the internet and then uh, you can you should be able to uh, crack the exam pretty simple okay and then you have a lot of things uh, you have youtube you have uh, IntelliPath's uh, blog, and then uh, there are also Salesforce own uh, material that is available to you on the web. So you can use all these things and uh, you can get through the exam pretty simple. So clearing exam is one of the simplest tasks. Learning Salesforce is the best thing that you can do. Okay, it's pretty simple to learn. 
okay but you need to have practice when you are learning a topic when you are attending a class uh, when you are attending a class when you are learning this it seems to be is it so simple but just close your laptop go out come back after 15 minutes and try to do the task you will get confused so you got to run these tasks multiple times okay you got to run these tasks multiple times you got to do hands on only then you will be able to understand the things okay so let me just come down to question and answers that are there uh, i got a question from neelkant uh, don't know coding in java c or c++ can i make a career in salesforce uh, so none of the clouds require so uh, neelkant there are two things one is salesforce configuration and customization so whatever we are talking about right now is only on the configuration side where you don't need any coding experience it is zero code uh, thing so you don't need to have any code coding knowledge at all when you go in for configuration part that in, in that invites development of uh, content using a product called apex so that is where you require this but for this you don't require anything and then uh, amit has got a question which says what does lightning means in salesforce so again salesforce has got a user interface okay salesforce has got a user interface and uh, when you build an application in salesforce okay you are uh, if you build it with lightning user interface okay if you build your application with lightning user interface you can build that uh, salesforce application once and then you can use it or let me answer it in a different way traditionally if you have to uh, build an application for your mobile and uh, handhelds and the ipads and the tablets of the world you have to do a specific app development and then if you want to do it for desktops and uh, laptops you have to build another application but with this lightning it is known with lightning you can build only one application build once access multiple places so lightning is a framework which is uh, going to give your application a dynamic ui context so if you build your application using this lightning user interface framework it is just the user interface the back end still remains same okay it's just the user interface part so what happens is if you look at it on a laptop it looks uh, it adjusts the entire user interface to fit the laptop screen or a desktop screen if you open it on a tablet depending on the screen okay it reduces the things in such a way that it is easy for you to read but still it rearranges the things that is called dynamic ui all right see the best example for dynamic ui is like uh, if you are uh, looking at the netflix okay if you are accessing netflix or if you are accessing prime video where as and when you click on uh, as and when you click on the movie it opens up in the landscape mode and when the movie opens up in the landscape mode you will be watching it like that uh, or in youtube if you click on any video it plays in a small uh, window but as soon as you turn your phone into a landscape mode the screen gets full screen right this is called dynamic user interface so all that kind of a dynamic interface is provided with the help of lightning in salesforce and then there is a question from pravallika uh, i tried to learn from intellipad for salesforce but left with many doubts so if i take paid training does lecturers clear all our doubts so pravallika you are already you were a you were a, a student of salesforce earlier okay so if you haven't learned anything in salesforce then definitely you can join for salesforce and the best oh okay so youtube uh, intellipat videos may not be uh, completely uh, there so if you join a salesforce course in intellipat i think uh, maybe the other people will talk to you about it but again if you are left with a number of queries 
if you join my batch and then there are some queries if i start another batch you are free to enroll into that batch also or maybe if there is another trainer i am not starting a batch and if any other trainer is starting it you can request support to let you enter into those topics where this particular thing is happening that is always possible intellipat is very very accommodative in that all right there are few more questions in the chat let me take them up so samson uh, like um, what happens is uh, salesforce development uh, for doing the salesforce development you need to understand the salesforce uh, landscape and the salesforce ecosystem and that entire information will be given to you in the salesforce admin course so even though you don't want to do a salesforce admin certification and settle down as an admin but your target is salesforce developer but still it is always uh, uh, it is i don't say good i will like to say required to go through the admin course because it gives you the complete uh, landscape and ecosystem uh, understanding so if you have that development becomes pretty simple so sandeep patel what is field service lightning again field service lightning is a separate uh, uh, license of from salesforce okay it is not an application it is not a cloud it is a separate license okay so it is a part of the service cloud but field service lightning is uh, uh, something like uh, um it's a service uh, related thing let me give you an example let's say you have purchased a big double door refrigerator from an organization and then that got installed at your home and then suddenly you you saw a leakage of water from that so you just cannot call up that service center and put it in your car and take that double door refrigerator someone has to come to your place and they have to do the repair over there so what you have to do is uh, the field service lightning will help you to locate the closest uh, service representative who can not the closest but the earliest service representative who can come and do the the service uh, to stop it because leakage is a big problem so they have to come they have to send someone at the earliest so there may be a person sitting right next to your house but his service might take another couple of hours there may be another guy who is 10 miles away but his service is over and he can come to your place in 20 minutes time so they will look at a lot of things and then they will uh, allocate the person all that uh, capabilities and capacity is there with the field service lightning and then again see if you have to learn field service lightning or uh, if you want to learn any other additional topics okay as i answered for uh, samson okay that particular uh, answer also applies over here you need to understand the landscape and the ecosystem of salesforce so for that you need to know the you need to know the the admin part of it so priyank uh, you are a person with the Uh, with the sales and marketing background so you know in and out of sales and marketing so i you can make a career in salesforce as a functional consultant either in sales or marketing uh, arena okay so you first have to complete the admin certification after the admin certification you can go either take a service cloud uh, a training or a Uh, you will have to go with the marketing cloud uh, uh, training so that would be your career path uh, i am not sure if we have a course in uh, a field service lightning i would leave this leave this question to the intellipat sales team to answer that okay and then uh, uh, amit uh, are you from india or are you from uh, us so amit if you are from india then um, just an admin certification i would not prefer to have one admin certification until unless you are uh, from a business analysis or a or a sales or a service kind of a functional area if you are a developer or if you are from a support role and you are trying to move into a salesforce uh, career it is always better to have a a developer certification also all right 
any more questions guys all right so over to intellipad support uh, thank you very much guys uh, thanks for attending this session bye bye hello everyone uh, this is rudrani this side i'm the senior course advisor at intellipad i will be telling you about the salesforce certification training program that intellipad provides if in case you're interested in going ahead and enrolling for this particular technology or getting a training for this particular technology so this is basically our portal it's www.intellipad.com and here you just type in salesforce so it will give you a list of courses that we provide all right so basically these are some of the courses for salesforce this one is the most popular one because it is covering all the aspects of salesforce from the administrative part the app building part and the platform developer one as well so we are going to completely help you gain proficiency in salesforce from the scratch to the advanced level concepts so before i move on to anything i would just tell you about a few key takeaways of this program so this is going to be entirely an instructor led training meaning that the entire delivery of the concepts will be done as a live interactive session with the instructor on a virtual platform like google meets or zoom these are instructors who themselves have been working as salesforce architects and have 15 plus years of experience in the industry apart from that 40 hours of self paced videos will be given to you these are the recordings that have been recorded in a controlled environment the access to this right away you get post the enrollment so if you are someone who wants to revise a little bit before you sit for the live classes uh, we would be able to do ahead go ahead and do so through the self paced videos that we provide a very very good practical exposure is given to you through 80 hours of industry specific real time live projects and case studies that you would be working on throughout the program all of these projects are going to be making sure that you have the necessary knowledge that can be put into practical use and also you can show an industry exposure on salesforce onto your portfolio then the certification that you would be getting would be from intellipad This certification is valid for a duration of lifetime. It is valid through all top organizations in India and abroad, and is going to be recognized as a professional certificate throughout. But if in case you want to accredit yourself with Salesforce, so these are the three exams that you would have to give, which is Salesforce Developer Five Zero One Advanced Developer Certification Exam, Salesforce App Builder Certification Exam. an administrator adm 201 certification exam now the complete curriculum and the training we provide is in line with these particular exams so using the training you would be able to go ahead and clear it very very easily now coming to the most important part the job assistant so this is a very lucrative service that we provide that helps our students get easy transitions into different domains uh if they want to start a career they are able to do so with this particular service and also if you are someone who you know wants to make a career in salesforce then you uh, we would be completely helping you out with the same through our job assistant service so it is a five step process that we follow the first step is as soon as you reach 80% of the completion of the program we will be assigning you a professional team who expertizes in portfolio building now this team would entirely be working on your cv your resume your linkedin profile and all the other official profiles that you have as to make it very very noticeable to the recruiters and your professional community make it look heavy on all aspects of salesforce and have all the right keywords to also pass the applicant tracking software that most mnc's have so once your entire portfolio is made we will be assigning you a team of training and placement officers who would be entirely responsible in communicating with you that if you're going ahead with the placements what are your expectations and requirements out of it so is that a particular location that you're looking at is that a firm is that a sector if you're already a working professional and looking to transition into salesforce what is the current ctc that you are holding because we always want a growth on your career chart and with you know trainings we 
trainings that we provide, you can easily expect a minimum salary hike in the range of 55 to 60% on your current salaries and also higher levels of positions in the hierarchy as well, which is why this is a very integral step for us to be able to segregate the organizations accordingly for you. Then we start with the job assistance. Regarding the job assistance, we have partnerships and collaborations with around 500 plus reputed multinational companies and tech giants all around the world and throughout India. And as a part of that, we actively give you placements, all of which are inclusively created for IntelliPath students. So you do not have to go ahead and compete with the entire crowd out there. So if I give you a generic example of the kind of companies that come to hire with us, that would be companies like Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, Cisco, NASDAQ, Sony, Ericsson, Dell, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Johnson & Johnson, McKinsey, Shell, Nomura, Accenture, TCS, Cognizant. So we also maintain the quality of placements from our end. Apart from that, as this is covering all the aspects of Salesforce, we will be giving you guaranteed of minimum three interviews with top multinational companies that hire for Salesforce architects guaranteed minimum three interviews now why we are going ahead and uh, saying that we give you a guaranteed minimum three interviews is because mostly all of our students whatever they expect from uh, the placements they get it in the very first three itself so if in case you want to explore more of course the fourth fifth sixth and the seventh one will also be conducted for you we will also be giving you the exclusive access to our portal so this portal uh, here you would be able to see all the vacancies as and when they come with our partnered companies and even you can apply from your end by showing intellipath certification as a verification post which direct interviews are scheduled for you and lastly, for all the interviews that you sit for, we would be end-to-end -end be training you for the same through various mock interviews, set of questions, salary negotiation skills, soft skills training, and all of that. So all of this all together is in one service, which is the job assistance. Our flexible schedule is there because uh, a lot of our students are also working professionals. So our flexible schedule is going to be maintained for them. We give you a lifetime free upgrade. So the lifetime access to the content that you have because all, of course, all of the live sessions that you will be attending are going to be recorded and put in your learning management portal, along with the self-paced videos and the projects that you have worked on. All of this comes with a lifetime free upgrade, meaning if there is any update in the technology that you are learning from us, we would be entirely updating your content from our end without charging you anything extra for the same. All right. And then there is going to be a mentor support. So there is going to be a career coach for you, someone who is himself a Salesforce architect, having a very good amount of experience in the industry. So he would be able to tell you as to what are the best options for you to choose. You know, how can you have a career growth and, you know, what is the best prospects for you and all of that. So all of this is going to be done. Now coming to the curriculum, the entire curriculum is laid out in such a manner that we will be taking you from the very basics to the advanced level concepts of this domain. So there is absolutely no prerequisite as of such for you to be able to take this program as everything is covered from scratch and in a very phased manner, we will be taking you to the advanced level concepts. Okay, so you can come with absolutely zero knowledge that is completely all right, because everything will be covered from scratch. So firstly, we will be covering the administrator and the app building content, and then we will be going ahead with the platform developer part. These are uh, some of the projects that you would be taking up throughout the program that is just for you to have an understanding as to how the projects are basically conducted. So basically, these would be projects like real time inventory management, uh, management system with Salesforce, admin and developer concepts, uh, building lightning applications, developer consoles, uh, you know, here, basically, you will be building a lightning component with Yelp search API that allows you to display a list of businesses near a certain location. So these are, you know, uh, for example, real life implications of Apex and Visual Force. So that is also going to be thought. So of course, more than these projects would be given to you, which will be making sure that you have enough industry exposure to put onto your portfolio to have easy transitions. Or if you're someone who's uh, starting with this, uh, you know, starting your career into this domain, so it would be easier for you to get through. Now, uh, peer learning is basically an application that you would be getting as a part of, uh, you know, being a student of IntelliPact. 
So here you will be added along with all of your classmates into one group. All the major announcements will be made here. We will be encouraging group projects and uh, you know hackathons and everything. This is basically to maintain a collaborative learning and a classroom-like experience or to also to help you network in the industry because we have a very, very vast uh, uh, you know, community of learners from all over the world, from all different positions of hierarchy and different backgrounds. So that is for you to have good networking in the industry as well as for job referrals. So this is something that you would also be getting. So you can go ahead and check these out. Um, certification we already discussed about. Now coming to the fees. The fees for this particular program, okay, so there are two trainings that we provide. One is a self-paced training and one is the online classroom. In the self-paced training, we will be giving you 40 hours of e-learning videos. You guide yourself through it. Anytime that you have doubts or you are stuck at any particular part of the course, you directly connect with the 24-7 technical support and access that we provide to you. They are available 24-7 around the clock. You can directly call them. You can email them the screenshot to your doubts so you can even conduct a Google meeting or a Zoom meeting with them. You can share your screen and discuss your doubts with them. And it also comes with a lifetime free upgrade, but the job assistance does not extend to this particular training. The cost for this particular program is 17,100. There would be 18% of GST on top of that, which will be making the course fee to somewhere around 20,000. So now coming to the online classroom, everything that is available in self-paced worth for 20,000 is first of all given to you for free. You will be having one-on-one -on -one doubt resolution sessions. You can attend as many batches as you want for a duration of lifetime without paying anything extra for the same. So there are two batches. One is a Saturday and Sunday batch wherein the classes are conducted on Saturdays and Sundays from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. in the evening. So... 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. on a Saturday, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. on a Sunday. The other batch is a Tuesday to Friday batch wherein the classes are conducted on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays and Fridays from 7 a.m. in the morning to 9 a.m. in the morning. The course fee for this particular program is 38,019. There is 18% of GST on top of that which will make the course fee to 44,862. So now we would be open to questions. You can download this career transition handbook if you want to see how our students have transitioned into this domain in the past. 55% uh, is the average salary hike that our students get. 40 LPA is the highest salary for this particular program. There are 700 plus career transitions, you know, as of now. And uh, of course, a lot of hiring partners as well are also there. So now we would be open to questions. Meanwhile, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be sharing with you my contact details. So if you want to go ahead and enroll in this program, kindly reach out to me on these contact details. So I am Rudrani. So I'm Rudrani Bahurupi. I'm a senior course advisor at IntelliPact, also a team lead, also looking after the enrollments for Salesforce. This is my email ID where you can reach me. And I will also share you my contact number. This is going to be my WhatsApp number where you can directly reach me. Kindly feel free to reach me out on any of these. Uh, either you can write to me on rudrani at intellipad.com or you can WhatsApp me on this number if in case you're interested to enroll for the program. So I had a question uh, which said, how long is the course going to go on? So if you're going ahead with a Saturday and Sunday batch, it will take you approximately three months to complete the program, 2.9 to be very precise. Okay, and if you're going ahead with weekday sessions, it is going to take you around 2.1 months to complete the program. Are there any other questions? Yes, Amit, please tell me. All right, we'll wait another minute for any questions that we may have. So if in case you are interested in any other course, Amit, this is the question is from Amit, you would be answering doubts pertaining to this course only or for others also, if contacted through WhatsApp, definitely you can contact me for any course that you are interested for, be it any domain, I would be helping you out for answering all of your doubts or if you're looking to enroll in any of the programs you can definitely contact on this number as well it does not have to be particularly limited to salesforce only 
if in case you are confused about which technical stack you want to go ahead with, you can definitely contact on this number and I would be able to help you out with the same. Okay, there is another question which says, can we attend both batches Saturday, Sunday and weekdays just in case if we, we miss the weekend batch? Yes, definitely Sandeep. Um, yes, you can do it. Uh, first of all, if in case you miss out on any of the classes, you can, of course, go through the recordings of the classes that you missed. But we also understand that you have enrolled for the live classes. So we will be giving you your share of the live class that you have missed. So, yes, you can cover it up during the weekdays. We will be assigning you a batch which is covering the topic that you missed. Or otherwise, we will also be letting you know as to uh, what we can do about it. But we will be making sure from our end, that would be completely our responsibility to make sure that you go ahead and get the live session for the topic that you missed. Now, this is also what we have mentioned on the website that you can attend n number of live sessions for a duration of lifetime. Meaning that, see, if in case you miss out on any of the classes, we arrange, uh, you know, parallel live classes for you so that you can cover up uh, what you have left in a live session itself. Otherwise, if in case after five years, again, you want to, you know, revise the entire thing again, or you get to know there are upgrades and you want to update your knowledge, again, at that point of time, also, you can go ahead and attend the live sessions without having to pay anything extra for the same. There is another question which says how much perfect job guarantee is there after this course. So basically, it is a 100% job assistance that we are providing. Job guarantee is something which is not, uh, you know, authentic to go ahead and give to students because it also all comes down to how you perform in the interviews. From our end, we will be equipping you 110% so that you would be able to confidently sit in the interviews and answer well with the recruiting partners. But then, of course, it all comes down to how you perform in the interviews as well. But definitely, I can go ahead and give a guarantee as to if you are thorough throughout the entire program, you would be able to go ahead and get a job very, very easily. All right. Uh, any other questions? Priyank had a question which said admin Salesforce certification is available at IntelliPath. Okay, so are you talking about the admin certification that you get from Salesforce? Because for that, you would have to give the examination for which we are going to train you. Okay. Just a quick info, guys. IntelliPath provides Salesforce online training mentored by industry experts. The course link is given in the description below.